you were both talking earlier um, really around developing the, the audience, understanding who the customer for this was. And in your case, you're talking about the internal customer <coughs> at first. You know, who do I have to pre-sell here? And then the external customer, who's this going to be? What kind of content it is? Now, you've got a somewhat different story because you're a retail outfit yep. and a little bit, let's face it, newer than these guys. Yeah. So <laughs> talk a little bit about what you did. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Bluefly.com is a high-end retailer of designer fashion and accessories. So uh, we're selling the Prada, Fendi, Gucci, Balenciaga, the very high end of uh, fashion and accessories. So um, where we really started out is we started out saying we want to basically push our product catalog um, out to as many different affiliates as we, as we can. And um, when we started out, we said this is really our primary use case because we have so many different affiliates out there that were doing um, different integrations for us um, really on a rev share basis. As they drive traffic to us, they get you know, a little portion of that pie if that customer actually converts. Um, but as we got into it, we found other use cases that were actually more compelling. And um, we started to basically reprioritize um, and found ones that made more business sense for us and started to, to rejigger which ones we actually wanted to implement first. So, for instance, the one that we actually went live with a couple months ago was an integration we did for our customer service team, uh, which is an integration to our IVR. Um, uh, with a high-end product, we have, unfortunately, a really high return rate. And with that return rate, um, customers are very anxious to get their credits back, either back into their account to make another purchase, you know, which we very much like, um, but sometimes they want it back in their credit card to help manage their credit balances you know, on their credit cards and, and such. Um, so we get a lot of calls into the call center just inquiring about when, when am I going to get this credit back. I sent the package back in, the UPS you know, tracking number says it was received at the warehouse, you know, when, when can I expect that back. So we get lots and lots of calls back in. We did an integration back in. Uh, to make that call back into our database, um, you know, through the Mastery API back into our database, and then as a result, we were able to cut that call volume into our call center by 20%. Um, so that was able to then, with our customer service staff, now get them focused on their true mission, you know, sort of one of the key things that you were talking about, which is really connecting the customer with the product. That's really what our customer service is really targeted at, is being that personal shopper, trying to help them say, you know, here's the product that we have, let me get, help you get you know, from point A to point B. Now, I like that because in this case, you'd think the data is catalog data. That's yeah. what people tend to think of, but it's data around functionality and, and method of delivery, right? And yeah. that turned out to be the more valuable thing. Yeah. It wasn't really about improving the core business. Yeah. Whereas yours mm -hmm. seems much more around what, what's yep. your core, how do you grow it in this new thing. Exactly. Um, do you think that's happenstance? Is it the nature of what you were developing? How do you account for the difference between the two of you? Um, I don't know if it's, if it's happenstance or just sort of the, you know, organically how we sort of saw yeah. um, needs in the business. Well, you were <laughs> online and the, you, your yeah. digital content was already pretty dynamic. Yes. It was, it, so it, it this is. was, yeah, well, that, and, and yours was less so. Yep. Yeah. So Sorry. it was really a question of, which aspect isn't being well utilized yet. Yeah. So that was kind of the, if you're looking for a guiding theme, yep. it might just be that. Which, which of the, let me think about the overall process here. And that was all internal development also? Yeah, so yeah, it was definitely all internal development. The IVR was a, uh, we use a third party provider mm -hmm. um, who manages the IVR for us. So we just partnered with them. You know, they did the, um, external development, you know, so the IVR hosting, right. but then they requested the key from us, you know, requested the key through Mastery, we approved that, and then basically made the call in to um, be able to get the status based on the order ID. So how many different parts of your organization did you have to sort of have talking to each other to make this work well? So the, so the, the good thing and the bad thing, I mean, Bluefly as an organization is very small. We're only about 85 people. So, oh, well, you just scream across the room. So, so quite literally, yeah. I mean, it, it really was maybe myself with the director of customer service and um, you know, our SVP of e-commerce e who's here today as well. And, and really, that, that's about all it took. Mm -hmm. wow. Dan, I just wanted to switch gears. Well, 
How many different parts of your organs? I was going to say, what's that like? <laughs> I got a lot. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. You got a few more, huh? Yeah. You got a few stakeholders <laughs> yeah. going there? Oh, yeah. And, and among them, you know, you talked about selling it quite well, how you have to sell mm -hmm. this. Um, what were the aha moments for them? Where they, you really, you know, I know there's people in this room that come from, you know, more mm -hmm. established companies that have to think about how to get the, you know, the, the decision makers behind this. Yep. In your experience, you got them to a certain level of familiarity. What was the aha moment? Was it an awareness of just how pervasive this is or how easy this might be or that this didn't have a lot of risk? What, yeah. what worked well? I think we definitely had to talk about risk. That's always a concern in our, our organization. Um, but I honestly think when I first really started gaining traction was when I made them really understand and we talked about an API and talked about a web service and talked about service-oriented architectures when they got it. I mean, it took a lot of pretty pictures and trying to make things really non-technical a lot of Lego analogies and other types of, of crazy analogies. But when they started getting that, and I started hearing people that weren't in, the, in IT, in senior operating team meetings, mentioning web services and SOA, that's when I knew it was really, oh, okay. it was well, really working. In that case, help out these people a little bit. Mm -hmm. What's a way they describe that world? So they can sure. take that kind of description back to their yeah. people. So it starts, so a little context, so at, at College where we've got a lot of different products and a lot of applications, but they're all built in a very siloed way. Um, so by using real world examples, so we actually, we actually had projects we were doing where we were literally ripping old siloed monolithic products apart and converting them into like a headless API. So, and we could use specific examples. So case in point, um, we did a project for SAT and they wanted a question of the day service. They wanted a, a, a question from the SAT test, a real question to go out to kids every single day they could subscribe to and answer it and it would kind of track your progress. Um, what we did was we turned it into a question service. So, and we showed them all, we ended up building an iPhone app, we ended up building all these things. And it was probably less money than it would have taken to build just the question of the day service the old way. And we kind of started showing them that and how it actually applies tactically in a real world application okay, of so. that is when they're like, oh, I get it. So we can build it once in one place and either us or other people can start building cool stuff on top of it. I get it. And it so and it, was, it wasn't, it was the conceptual landscape to a certain extent, mm -hmm. but it was really handing them a prototype. Yeah, yeah, was, I think that's probably them a model. That was probably the closest thing to an aha moment. Yeah. Okay, I, I got a question for both of you. How do you think this style of work changes a company? What do you think changed inside College Board as a consequence? And take Bluefly too. Sure. So. Uh, I think from a technology perspective, it changes things in how teams work together. I mean, they were, when I first got there, and it still to this extent, was structured around products, which doesn't always make sense when you're doing things in a more API SOA architecture. So you had teams that have spent the last 10 years working on this product and never actually touched other aspects or other things. And when they would build something, they would have not a whole lot of repercussions across the enterprise, because they would just change one monolithic product and nothing's gonna happen. As we started converting those and making them into more of a flattened, kind of mm -hmm. layered architecture, now it's like, well, wait a second, how do we organize our, our organization? I mean, do you have a web services team and a presentation layer team and a backend team, or do you still have, so that raised well, that, some that really raises interesting question questions. About, it raised the question about whether or not you wanna tell management that this is an effect it's gonna have on the organization. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. They kinda of like their org chart, right? Well, yeah, and it's, it's interesting, because I think people, so that, there was a little bit of that dynamic too, where you're threatening some, there's some territorial it's gonna happen, battles, right? but yeah. I think people came around and realized it's the right thing to do, and it, and it makes sense, and it's not, no one's getting laid off or losing their job because of it, they're just becoming. They're thinking more broadly about yeah, what they exactly. do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's transformational, right? I mean, it's, it's come from, you know, a lot of our uh, senior management has come from traditional retailing, merchandising, and marketing organizations where uh, everything is done from uh, more one-off or file-based and feed-based structures. And so in that particular case, you just do a feed. And that's uh, an analogy that only goes so far. And when you're starting to try to move away from that kind of model where you're just doing a one-off for one particular company and, mm -hmm. one, and that you're creating is something not more dynamic. scalable, yeah. right? And you're trying to move away from that. And that's really where we're starting to, you know, really having to manage their expectations away from that, that mm -hmm. we just cannot continue to operate that way. And, um, and we're getting there. And that's really what most of this year has been about, is sort of resetting that expectation and trying to um, 
do a lot of the education and a lot of that. Um, here's where we need to get to. So it's a lot of that future. But they fishing. see the benefit to begin. Most with. certainly. So most certainly they know where you're it goes. leading from strength. And also, I think there are a lot of other good examples that have already um, been proven out there, and other businesses that are even built out there um, on this kind of model that that they can kind of see. By the way, are there colossal failures that you have to, you know, <laughs> that other people point to, and you say it won't be like this? I swear. Um, I mean, I think we have. Th I mean, we have our own, you know, maybe projects that we haven't done well. Yeah. But I think there's also other businesses that other people have. Well, people um, expect it. It's not a perfect of world. Of course. I mean, no, nobody's got you know 100 percent batting. Just average. wondering if people should be on their guard about something somebody's going to bring up. You know. Yeah, I, I don't know that you can protect against everything, right? I mean, every business is going to be a little bit different, and um, that's where you got to be a little bit open and honest, right? I mean, you have to. You, you do, you know, have to take some chances when you're going to innovate. And in this particular case, what you're trying to do is, if you think back to that slide that Oren was showing this morning about unlocking mm -hmm. all those layers, right? And mm -hmm. unlocking those layers of uh, data and logic. And yeah. that's really the key of it, right, is it's really unlocking those pieces. And of course, you know, you, you balance risk. It's the risk of doing this versus yeah. the risk of watching everybody else do this, yep. you know, who you want to be in this world. Let's take a couple questions from the audience if we got them. Questions? Yes, ma'am. So just so so overall. You want to repeat that question? Yeah. So so I think the question was, in the beginning, we faced a lot of resistance around from brands. So selling brands, um, how did we manage through um, that initial resistance of selling those brands? Is that that's so so in our business because we're a retailer, sort of abstracted a little bit. Um, we did face a lot of resistance from brands, you know, selling their product and selling at a discount because. A lot of brands have a um, want their product to be sold only in a certain way and only in certain places. And they so, want the control. And yeah. for sure, they want that um, uh, presented in a certain way. You know, it's about the it's about image. It's about um, having that presented in a certain way. So it took a lot of uh, handholding. It took a lot of communication with the brands. It, it took working with them on it. <coughs> Um, almost season by season basis, continually talking to them and working with them to try to basically make sure that um, we knew that, or that they knew that we were working for them and trying to be an extension of their brand online. We wanted to be, you know, an, uh, a site for them online. Many brands don't have sites and read and sell their their products online. A lot of them sell only really through stores. A lot of them only sell. Um, you know, if they have a site online, they maybe do a little bit of commerce, not a whole lot. You know, a lot of them really go through, you know, the primary retail channels. And so, you know, this whole push to go online these last few years um, has been uh, scary for a lot of designers. You know, they just haven't really embraced a lot of that technology channel. So, what we had to do is sort of, you know, try to embrace them, you know, and embrace their fear in that particular case and try to really. <laughs> meet them where they were um, and try to reassure them. Mm -hmm. Another question? No? I think we'll take a break then. Danny, Matt, thank Great, you very thank much. Thank you very much. Okay. Oren, did you want to say something? Oh, sorry.